you for tuning in again tonight. The to hot topic in the news this week. This is a show where I try to educate real stories. Thank you for watching Truth and Justice with Vivian King. We have a different show for you tonight because I had one planned in which a female was going to tell her story of going to prison over and over again and how she finally caught a break with the Human Resources Department when she told them the truth about her past. She has a great job now and she wasn't able to come. Someone called in sick and she had to work a second shift. So as this is a live show, we're going to proceed anyway. Remember, this is a free speech show where we talk about the criminal justice system and we try to educate through story. Tonight, because our guest, who had a great, great story to tell, didn't make it, we're going to talk about a couple of topics in the news. I have a great panel assembled. We have uh, Miss Alicia Thomas, who has been on the show before. She was our guest who told her story January 2nd, 2013. Um, her story will be on the internet within the next week on YouTube at Vivian R. King on my YouTube channel, and it's a great uh, motivational story. I also have my dear friend, uh, Charlie Jones, who's agreed to be on the panel tonight, and give us uh, his perspective from the male perspective. Charlie's been arrested a few times, usually not in Texas, about things that he would felt, uh, felt uh, strongly about. And then we have a college graduate, uh, Renita Antoine, who'll give us the young person's perspective. So, first of all, I have some good news. I had a federal case dismissed today, so I'm very happy about that. Uh, I want to share something with my viewers who are always complaining about court-appointed lawyers. I was actually court-appointed. Uh, I got her case dismissed today because we were I was dealing with an extremely fair prosecutor, and um, he realized that uh, the evidence wasn't strong. He was going to give her pretrial diversion, which is a program where they reset the case for a year, she had to pay restitution back, and um, basically we're going to dismiss the case after a year. But instead, he decided I could never get her out on pretrial release. In the federal system, it's called a detention hearing when you're arrested, and if you can show that you have ties to the community, in the federal system, they let you out on your own recognizance. This young lady was extradited here from Nevada, and they, she was brought here by the U.S. Marshals, and the pretrial services section to let you out on your own recognizance wants you or the person you live with to own the home. She didn't own a home and no one in her family owned a home. Her sister, who's the most stable, lives in Nevada. She doesn't own a home, but she's been in the same apartment for about five years. She works, she has children, she has a husband. Her mother lives at the same apartment. So I couldn't get her out. So she's been in jail since October of 2012. So once the prosecutor found out she never got out, he felt bad. He said, you know, I'll just, I think we had calculated the restitution to be about $1,800. And it was supposed to be a conspiracy to commit, uh, to commit theft and fraud where people were being defrauded. And my client was a part of that scheme. Uh, and she was getting like a $200 fee every time she did this transaction. So, but what I want to share with you is, since she's from Nevada, when they let her out, I don't know what time they're going to let her out, today or tomorrow or Monday, she'll just be let out on the street. And she has no ties to Houston. So as a concerned citizen <laughs> and her court-appointed lawyer, I am going to buy her some clothes. I am going to buy her some shoes. And I've already called her mother to try to arrange that the Greyhound, that she pay for a Greyhound bus ticket and have it at the bus station so I can get her to the bus station this evening. And the thing about the clothes is weird because she came in clothes, but her mother said they sent her clothes back. The U.S. Marshals mm -hmm. mailed her, sent her clothes back to Nevada. Think about what that means. They didn't ever anticipate her getting out. They sent her clothes back. So now she has to get out in her prison clothes. 
unless I get us some street clothes to travel back in. Right. So anyway, I thought that was an interesting little story that the marshal sent her clothes back to, to her mother. Who gave them, who told them to do that? They just assumed she was going to go to prison. Mm -hmm. And when you go to prison in the federal system, you can go anywhere in the in the in the in country. The so mm -hmm. it doesn't, you know, it, she wouldn't have been going to prison here. She would have probably been going to prison closest to her family, which is in Nevada, right mm -hmm. outside of uh, Las Vegas. Oh, okay. So that's an interesting story. <laughs> we're going to talk about a couple of interesting things today, and we're going to talk about first of all a pet peeve of mine. I need your help, viewers, and panel. I need your help. I need y'all to help me. Practicing law as long as I have, I have a few pet peeves. So I have a young lady that uh, one of the judges asked me to work with. I try to work with women in the criminal justice system. It's court appointed in the state system. She has, uh, she's had about seven theft convictions. And even if the theft amount of the item stolen is under, is a misdemeanor, the third theft misdemeanor becomes a felony. So she's had about three or four felonies, but the amounts are small. The amounts are, are, are small. They're going to be under $2,000, basically, under $1,500, basically. So they call that theft third offender, even if it's your fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth time. Mm -hmm. So the DA wants to offer her 20 months in state jail. And as you know, state jail is day for day. So that's like a year and a half. And it's because she had just gotten out of state jail for theft and done 15 months. She'd just been out a few months when she got another theft. She was caught shoplifting in a store where she'd stole two laptop computers and, and was about to get in a getaway car when she was run down by the loss prevention person at Walmart and, and they got the items. So let me tell you what the pet peeve is. The prosecutor, when you negotiate for someone that's in jail, so say, for example, I'm negotiating with Charlie. You're the prosecutor, Charlie. Okay. So I'm telling you, look, she has a grandbaby on the way. I'm telling them everything that the girl's telling me. Mm -hmm. Of course, I always say, if you didn't do it, <laughs> let's go to trial. But no, 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 Ms. King, I, you know, no, I don't want to go to trial. So she, I'm saying, okay, well, she has a grandbaby on the way. She wants you to know that, prosecutor. She wants to get out. Uh, what can I do? She tells me that everybody in jail that she's in the tank with is getting second and third and fourth chances. They're getting 1244A, and they're getting probation. And, I've, and she's never had a probation, so she wants probation. You're the prosecutor, Charlie. You're telling me she's done six months, she's done a year, she's done 15 months, and now it's 20 months. I'll give her one year today if she takes it. Tell me why you think prosecutors speak that way, Charlie. Yes, basically they speak that way uh, based on the kind of time they believe they can get with an individual. I mean, it, it doesn't necessarily have something to do with that person per se. I mean, some guys, I mean, some prosecutors want to be tough. So, um, and, and I'm just saying I'm not a, a prosecutor or a defense lawyer or whatnot, but I mean, at some point in time, do you get to go to the prosecutor's supervisor? You can, and you're, and that's an interesting point. What is, what do you think? Um, well, you know, <clears throat> my thing is, uh, a lot of times, well, I've heard judges say this, "Oh, you back in my court again?" Okay, so that kind of sets the standards for everybody: the DA, the prosecutor. Okay, look, she's been through here numerous times. Even the judge said it. So that's they, they call themselves trying to uh, teach one a lesson. So. You're that's exactly really, right. Yeah, that's really my point of view. So we're going to give her the maximum, you know, we can offer. And the maximum in this case is uh, 24 months. Mm -hmm. uh, so what do you, why do you think a prosecutor does that, Renita? I agree with Alicia. Um, being a repeat offender, you know, it. I guess, I don't know, you know, the first time you serve, you know, you only serve for six months, okay, you know, it, it's thought, you know, you should have learned your lesson by the second time, third time, okay. You know, so it's just, I guess with the fact that you're, you know, you've given, you've been given so many chances and you've, you've used them all up. So now, what I do I do? Maximum. What do I do? Um, now I've done this so many times. I can't get a job because now I have seven theft convictions on my record. So who's going to hire me? So I go and steal some more. What do I do? How do I get out of this vicious circle, cycle? 
But my pet peeve is that the client b blames me, the lawyer, okay? <laughs> so it's like, oh, you're not working hard enough for me. You're not working hard enough for me. Now, most people hear my reputation in jail, so they don't talk to me as bad as they do a lot of court-appointed lawyers. Mm -hmm. And I don't do many court appointments. So, but I have been doing them in Vanessa Velasquez's court, and I do want to help women. Mm -hmm. And I do need to get my feet back on the ground. After I lost judge, I need to get back with the regular people and try to see what's going on. So I, I have two or three women, I have about five women that I'm dealing with right now that are court appointment, appointed. And so they're the hardest to deal with because they're the people that are in jail over and over. Their families don't bond them out. Mm -hmm. they're, they're through with them. And their family's not going to pay any money for mm -hmm. a lawyer. So they're the people who are the most <coughs> desperate uh, people to deal with. So over and over, I can't talk to her in the holdover or in the jail to say, what can we do? What can I do with you? I mean, you know, how many kids do you, what can I do? What can I do to help you not do this again? I don't want to hear that. I just want to get out of jail, and I want to know why I can't have 1244, which is a felony punished as a misdemeanor. So the most time you can do is six months in the county. Because the DA says no. The DA is cussing me out behind you. She's talking to me like I'm you, okay? I don't know what to do. You want to go to trial? Let's do it. Because she's telling me, I never got past the cash registers. I was inside. I read the police report to her. It says that not only did you run past the cash registers, you were you they you, there was almost a shootout in the parking lot where you're jumping in this man's <laughs> truck. They've had to block the vehicles and blah blah blah. And her priors were violent uh, thefts where there's always an altercation with the loss prevention person at a Burlington coat factory, at different places where there's fighting when people are trying to arrest her, where there's violence. There's one that's a theft from a person. So they're all, the priors are bad. And she had been given probation the last, uh, like a year and a half before. And the next day, she had two pending cases at the same time. She got one on April 28th in which she's got, they gave her probation, even though she'd had six fel, uh, thefts. But they saw that the day before, they charged a, another crime on her for stealing, and so they revoked her probation, like right away. She never got to report. So, Ms. King, I want probation, I want probation, I want probation. I said, well, the prosecutor's kind of mean. She's, she's fussing at me and talking to me bad, like I'm you. Do you want to negotiate with her? Can I go get her? And we all talk together. So they bring the prosecutor nice enough to come back because a lot of them don't want to do wow. that and she comes back and the prosecutor and her go at it they go at it they go at it and so the prosecutor says look i think you're a thief i think you're a drain on society i think you'll never learn my client is saying well look my my son's about to go to, to iraq he's been deployed from fort hood I was unstable. I just needed to get some money so that I could go to Fort Hood to take care of my grandson. It just sounds like more lies, really, but, you know, whatever. Because, you know, I don't know. So, but she's, 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 you know, she's working it the best she can. And the prosecutor's like, I, I don't trust you, but I will go to the judge and see if the judge will take a risk on you. Because you can go to a judge without an agreed recommendation from the prosecutor, and the judge can give you that last-ditch effort to get probation. Now, the law is that you have to swear when you get probation that I've never been convicted of a felony in this state or any other state in the United States. That's the Texas law on getting probation. You have to take that oath. But judges, there is an exception in the <coughs> law where a judge can give you a second chance and give you a deferred adjudication, which is not a conviction, to see if you're going to make it. But a lot of times they don't want to use the resources on you because you don't seem like you're going to follow the rules. Because yeah. one of the rules is going to be to get a job. Mm -hmm. And we know it's going to be difficult for her to get a job. Right. So the judge uh, the judge said, I said, but judge, she's she telling me about the 20,000 other people in jail who've gotten the probation. And all she wants to talk to me about is other people. This is my pet peeve. But Miss King, this other girl got this. This other girl got this. These are not girls that are back there in the jail with her that I see. These are people back over at the actual physical jail location. You follow what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. How can I verify that? What can I do about that? Every case is different. I don't That's know. Right. And I'm spending all my time talking to her about what everybody else got. Why do people in jail do that? I mean, what can, what can I say to make her happy? Because I can't deal with what Tanya got, uh, Lucy got, because, I, first of all, I can't even look it up to see if that you're accurate because you don't know their first and last name. You don't know their spin number. You don't know their case number. And that's, what, that's one of the biggest pet peeves with uh, lawyers is that you're constantly, clients are constantly telling us what somebody else got. 
What do you think I should do about that, Alicia? I would, um, first thing I would tell her, look, you got this theft case by yourself. Tanya, JoJo, and Jackie, they didn't get it with you. We're talking about you. This is an individual situation, and you must understand that I'm dealing with you and your record. And this is what everything is, is based on, you. And you know what's, and what's so logical about what you're saying, it would be easy if people listen to you, but you know that when people are in jail, they're desperate, they're talking fast, they're out-talking you. Mm -hmm. So as soon as you try to say something logical, like I stopped and listened to what you said, they won't do that. But Ms. King, you don't care about me. You don't care about me. You know, the whole time I try to explain it, they're steady talking back to you. You know, like, you're not trying to hear me. You're not trying to help me. It's never, let me take responsibility. I know I did this. I want to change. Or I know I have to be punished for my mistakes. It's always what you've done to put me here. Do you understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. It's a very, very frustrating situation to be in. So the judge came, uh, Vanessa Velasquez, being a very fair judge, knowing that the prosecutor doesn't want to take a chance on her, says, call her out. I'll talk to her for you, Ms. King. She had a busy docket. She didn't really want to deal with it, but she called it. She talked to her. She said, look, I will do something called an LSIR, which is, it's, it's, a, it's an acronym for a, an interview that the probation department can do to find out a total social history on her to see if she has a drug problem, psychological problems, to see if, if given probation, what programs are available for that her. might help her succeed. And that's where we left it today. The judge said, I'm still telling you, your judge, lawyer has been begging our hearts out to do this. I'm still not saying I'm going to do this for you, but I am going to at least let probation interview you and write up a report on what could help you. Wow. And uh, even though you've been, and this woman looks like she's 40 years old, so this is not like a baby. This is somebody that's been in the system since, I think the first probation she got was in 1991. Okay? So basically what she's doing is really helping us out. Who is that? The young lady. I mean, since now she got a chance to speak before the judge, she's getting the final say from now. Uh, she's basically going to go along with giving the story to the probation department. They're going to write a recommendation up or something along that line. So <laughs> she hasn't lost anything at this point in time. She hasn't lost anything. And I would have talked to the judge either way. Uh, so she hadn't lost anything. But I, I'm not going to be speculating, but I'm, I'm like 90% sure the judge is not going to give it to her. But she is at least giving her that option, you know, to tell her that I will look into it. Because the problem with probation is you have to have a, a house to live in. You have to have a place where they can find you. So there are some criteria that have to be met. And remember, the only person she'll tell us about is his son going to Iraq, and he lives in Fort Hood. You have to be in probation in Harris County. You so, can't be there. Sometimes. So it's not possible or possibly that she would tell to the probation department more information that she than she's given so far? It is possible, but don't you think that's not unfair for her lawyer to, to give them more information than she's given me? I, I agree. I mean, basically, she should be giving the lawyer what's necessary so that the lawyer can, you know, put something forth for her. But in her scenario, and I'm just saying for in that particular scenario, she's basically gotten to the judge now. I mean, she said you wasn't helping her per se, but yet you're the one that actually getting her to the judge. So you're still helping her. But whether the judge do that or not, at some point in time, she's going to have to either say, hey, she going to trial or accept. Right. Oh, she doesn't want to go to trial. Yeah. You know, I'm a trial lawyer. I'm ready. Right. But she doesn't want to go to trial because she understands that it could be worse. Let's take a call. Caller, thank you for calling Truth and Justice of Vivian King. Hello there, Ms. King. How you doing? Hey, Tracy. All right, uh, I want to say hello to uh, Renita and uh, Alicia and Charlie. Hi, Tracy. Hi. All right, Tracy. now, Tracy. Uh, all I want to say, uh, Miss King, I, I think uh, I, I don't think you can do just be honest with her. And just tell us it, do, it don't look very prompted for you. You know, uh, some people could be here, some people can't. You know, it, it's not too many lawyers that have the same heart that you have. You know, most like they, they don't really care about the client, but, but you do. And, uh, I, I just, I just said, I said, well, look, you, you, you're a thief. You know, you're a thief. <laughs> you know, you, 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 can't, you can't perform miracles. I said, I, 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 you know, just, I, I can do it, be honest with 
just tell them, that, look, I, 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 I do, they say I care for you, I try to help you, but look, 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 look at your past, look at your history. If I get you off this case, even, even if you were, uh, got acquitted off the case, within a month, she'll be, she'll be back in that game for the same thing. You know, tell, tell her she needs to get a job and uh, work for a little like everybody else do. I agree, Chasey. I don't know what you're telling you. <laughs> I agree with you, baby. I agree. I'm not a lawyer. I'm not a lawyer. I don't intend to do it, but I don't pretend to be, but uh, that's what I'm telling you. Okay, Tracy, I appreciate it. Look, we're going to talk a little bit more about another topic, so call back if uh, if it's interesting to you, okay? Thank you, Tracy. All right, Renita, you have an opinion on this? You know, when someone does something repetitively, it forms a habit. And I think um, maybe, maybe, you know, if they, like the old saying says, if it walk like a duck, talk like a duck, quack like a duck, it's a duck. And I think that, you know, it would take for, it would take her to change the person who she is or who she allowed herself to become. So, yeah. Well, I'm just saying my frustration and pet peeve is that I always have to answer questions about what somebody else got and, and I don't even know who that person is. What you don't understand is that's what she spends all of her time talking to me about. And I can't answer that question. Right. And it's a and it's real common when people are in jail in a hopeless situation to talk about everybody else who saw their way out. Yeah. So I spend all my time saying, okay, well maybe that person stole from their grandmother, and their grandmother don't want to prosecute. So that's why they're giving them probation after they've been in jail five times. But like I said, Vanessa Velasquez is a very open-minded judge. She's willing to listen to both sides, and she saw how frustrated I was trying to advocate for her when it's kind of, my back is up against the wall. Because, you know, that's not a case that can be dismissed. It has to be tried. Right. And, you know, when you're stealing from stores, it's on video. Right. So all this is, you know, it's not anything that you can really fight against. Okay, let's change the subject. Let's talk about, uh, oh, we have one more call, and it's probably on that subject, and then we'll change the subject after this call. Thank you for calling. Hey, Ms. King. Hey, this is Danny Sneed, how are you doing? Hey, Danny, the encourager. How are you? I'm doing just fine. I want to say hello to your 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 guest and especially your special guest, uh, my friend and co. Uh, um, just my friend, uh, Alicia. How are you doing, Walker Walk? All right. How are you today, brother Danny? How are you doing? Good. Um, I, I was listening, and I want to get right to the point, Miss um, King. Uh, one of the things I would suggest. Uh, when you're talking to your clients, is trying to, to find out what are the underlying issues. You, you're talking about shoplifting, you're talking about repetitive. Okay, I'm doing this, but why am I doing this? I'm not doing this to pay bills. What is what is underneath the, the, the reason to steal to go out and just work? Because having a theft on your record doesn't prevent you from getting a job. Maybe getting a job at the place you stole from, but it doesn't keep <laughs> Job. That's all I wanted to add. It's sometimes some underlying issues mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that if you were more informed that why we do things, you could approach it a little different than just the behavior. Okay. Thank you. I'll go see you over at the jail and I'll find out why I try, but trust me, she all she wants to talk about is what somebody else got. But maybe if I will sacrifice going after church on Sunday, but I'm not going to go this Sunday because it's Super Bowl. But maybe if I go <laughs> at a different time in space, I can find out what the underlying issue is, and I'll do that, Danny. Thank you. Thank you. Thank right. you for All right, bye-bye. Hey, let's talk about the lady who was about to get executed uh, last night, and it was stayed. Uh, her name is Kimberly McCarthy, and um, let's talk about her crime. All right, she has two priors. She's in Dallas County, it, two priors for forgery, and... Um, it's, this happened July 21st, 1997, and she entered the home of her 71-year-old neighbor, Dorothy Booth, under the pretense of borrowing some sugar, and then stabbed Miss Booth five times, hit her in the face with a candelabra, cut off her left ring finger, and stole her diamond wedding ring. McCarthy left with Miss Booth's purse and wedding ring, drove Ms. Booth's Mercedes-Benz to a crack house where she attempted to buy crack cocaine. She later pawned Ms. Booth's wedding ring for $200 and used 
the victim's credit cards at least four times on the day after the murder. McCarthy was originally convicted of capital murder of Ms. Booth in 98, but her conviction was reversed because after she was received her Miranda warnings, which is your right to remain silent, you have the right to have an attorney present if you're here, or you have a right to stop talking, Ms. McCarthy invoked her right to counsel, which means she wanted a lawyer present. She did that unambiguously. It was clear she invoked her right to counsel. After she said that, the law says that the police are supposed to stop questioning the person and just send them over to their cell or let them go. They still questioned her, and from that questioning, she wrote a confession or wrote a statement of what happened. And the statement was something like this. Early Tuesday morning around 1.30 a.m., drugs were delivered to me at my residence by Kilo and J.C. Two guys I met in South Dallas seven drugs about a month or so ago. Both the guys stayed at my residence and partied with me. After my money and drugs ran out, they asked if I could get some more money. I told them no. They asked me if I knew any neighbors I could borrow money from, and I said no. Not at that hour, and I had to go to work. At that time, they began to verbally abuse and threaten to harm me if I didn't come up with some more money. I called my neighbor, Dorothy Booth. I'm not sure of the time, and I got no answer. I waited until she called me back. To make a long story short, she basically confesses to what happened. She makes it a little, a little simpler, not as violent as the synopsis says. But because that statement was introduced into evidence, even though it should not have been, because remember, the judge is the gatekeeper of the law. The judge should not have let that in in her trial, but the judge did. Because judges are elected and they're scared to follow the law. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the Court of Appeals reversed it, the conviction. She had another trial without that statement. Even though she had a trial without that statement again, she was still convicted and given the death penalty, for which she's on death row now. And last night, she was supposed to be executed. So they say that the, in the punishment of the, when she got retried, they say that in addition to Booth's murder, McCarthy had also murdered two other elderly women. I don't know where they found this from, but this came out in the second trial. The first was Maggie Harding, an 82-year-old longtime friend of McCarthy's family, who had helped organize McCarthy's wedding and had let McCarthy store excess furniture at her home. Hmm. Harding was stabbed several times in the face, chest, and abdomen, including one wound piercing her heart. She also suffered traumatic injuries to her face, including a broken jaw, crushed cheekbone, and bleeding on the brain. These wounds were consistent with being caused by a meat tenderizer found in the kitchen sink. Harding's purse was missing from her home. The second of McCarthy's alleged elderly victims was an 85-year-old, physically disabled Jetty Lucas, a distant cousin of McCarthy's mother. Lucas was stabbed in the face, including wounds piercing her eyes. She also suffered blunt force trauma to her head, neck, including strikes which tore one of her ears, fractured her skull, and caused bleeding on the brain. These injuries were consistent with a claw hammer found near Lucas's body. The contents of Lucas's purse and wallet were missing. In addition, McCarthy had convictions for forgery, theft of services, and prostitution. While incarcerating awaiting trial, McCarthy assaulted, threatened, and took advantage of other inmates and violated many prison rules. McCarthy is the wife of Aaron Michaels, the founder of the New Black Panther Party, which he describes as a self-help group for African Americans and poor people. They were married in 93 and have a five-year-old son. Michaels, whose legal name is McCarthy, filed for divorce in 96, and the couple separated before Booth's sling. Michaels, Michaels testi testified during the sentencing phase of her trial that his wife had problems with crack cocaine, but has been clean since their son was born. So, a lot of times when you have a retrial, the, the prosecutors come back bigger and badder. Mm -hmm. And uh, the defense lawyer has to defend those allegations. So, she, if executed, she'll be the second woman in Dallas County to ever be executed, um, according to the newspaper articles. So, Tell me what you think about it. Oh, and another thing is um, the 70 year old neighbor that she killed had been a, she was a retired psychology professor. Mm. And um, 
we have a problem with violence in our community. Um, it's really bad with kids. Kids don't fight anymore. They just kill each other mm -hmm. um, for no reason at all. Alicia, since you've been down, um, tell us a little bit. You said you, you know, you've been to prison a bit, and you said you were in prison with Carla Faye Tucker, right? Yes, ma'am. Tell us about that. Who? That was. Um, <clears throat> that was. Um, and tell a us a little bit about tell, Carla Faye Tucker, since we have a youngster here that's 23 and doesn't even know who she is. Uh, Carla Faye Tucker. I want to say she killed a real estate agent, if I'm not mistaken. Don't no, quote me, unquote. Uh, here in Houston. Uh, I want to say in the late 70s or so, and uh, she blundered her to death with a uh, pickaxe. And uh, yeah, they used to call it the pickaxe murder. Mm -hmm, the pickaxe murder. It was very. It was, it was worldwide. It was talked about, and uh, I ended up doing time with her, which she lived in the uh, death quarters. You know, they had it was about like maybe six women at that time, and believe it or not, before I left that unit at the end of '98 the population of the women on death row had grown unanimously. Really? Yes, and uh, a lot of the guards that had been there on Mountain View said it had never been that many women on death row. It had gotten so big where they had to make additional housing for the ladies. But anyway, make a long story short, um, I don't know Carla from here on the streets. I just met a, a warm, Heart, very heartwarming warming person. You know, I pass by uh, from time to time, and she'd be outside the little. Uh, they had their own living quarters on uh, Mountain View unit, and uh, she, God bless you, Alicia. You know, she was just very heartwarming person, and you know, everybody changed. You know, uh, addiction, uh, like Brother Danny said, the caller. Uh, people have underlying issues that go without being taken care of. And before, when it's too late, you got a problem on your hand. Mm -hmm. You got a situation bigger than the, the addiction itself, you know. And uh, but the big argument was with Carla, uh, being that she had uh, given her life to Christ, and uh, a lot of the ministries outside supported her, but they say they had men that had the same, you know, spiritual awakening. So what made her different than the men? It was because she was a woman. Yes. But because she was a woman in our society, we take care of women. Society felt that maybe she should not be killed. But at, like you said, on the same token, right. the men had given themselves to Christ. Correct. But had still been killed. And, and that was a big debate. That was a big debate. Mm -hmm. Not saying that was a part of her fight or whatever, but that's what we knew. That's what we saw on TV, you know. But Let's take a call, please. Caller, thank you for calling Truth and Justice with Vivian King. Yeah, it, it, it's me again. Uh, I, I want to say that uh, there was a lady called uh, Frances Newton. Newton and, uh, man, we went to school together. I knew her personally. And uh, she got married to I, I don't believe her. Uh, I don't believe she, in my heart, I don't believe she did it. Wow. And the type of person she's supposed to kill the husband or whatever. And there was Francis McLemore uh, Newton. She was Francis McLemore before uh, she got married. Wow. She, put, she, she was accused of killing her husband and, uh, and I think her kids, too. Mm -hmm. Did you know about her? Did you know her? I, mm -hmm. She came a little bit before I left Mountain View. I didn't get the opportunity to meet her personally, you know, but uh, she came a little bit. Her and another young lady that was here from Houston, she was one of the youngest ones, uh, Erica Shepard, that was on death row. I don't know anything of her state now. What happened? Yeah, but she was the youngest, and I'm talking about real young. But yeah, and yeah. one of the first Tracy, African what do you Americans. Think? Tracy, what do you think about? Because uh, Carla Faye Tucker was white. What do you think, Tracy, about uh, women being executed? Should it be? Should the death penalty be equally used with women and men? Well, uh, yeah, yeah, of course. I think she'd be. I, I don't really believe in the death penalty, but. Uh, I, I guess I, I guess if it's gonna be a death penalty, I think it should be equally. Uh, you know, if, if, if you kill somebody, like uh, I for I two for two. I got you. But, but like, like I say, uh, like Francis McLemore, I, I went I went to school with. Y'all know Francis Newton, no, no, mm -hmm. but uh, I, I really in my heart I, I don't believe she, she she can make that because I, I know a person that she wasn't the type of person you know to do that. But you know, one of the I, things that we learn in society is drugs will change your personality. 
She went on Trinity drugs. I don't, I, not that I know of. Okay, and I don't know at all, and I ho and I hope she wasn't. But I'm just saying that's one of the things I've noticed in representing people is that drugs changes their personalities according to their family members and loved ones. But it, it, it was very sad. It was very sad for me. You know, when when the executor, it, it, it was very sad. And I, you know, I mean, you know, for her to be on death row for so long, you know, they, they, they could have gave you know just. Uh, there was a life that's gone, you know, gone, you know, gone for no reason. And man, man, probably about the same age. Well, God bless you. That's all I, uh, I was just saying, God bless you, Tracy. Thank you for calling and weighing in on this conversation. Okay, thank you for uh, taking my call. Thank you. All right, Charlie, what do you think about uh, women on death row? I mean, I'm, I'm against the death penalty, but at the same token, I mean, depending on I mean, according to what they're saying, that this lady did all of what they said. Now, I don't know what she did or right. she didn't. And then the other two that they talk about, it wasn't like she actually had a trial in those scenarios, did she? It's my understanding that they were extraneous offenses, like unsolved murders that they solved with her. So all I don't know the complete history. I just got this write-up because I was going to be on the radio last night about this show. So I believe that that's... Uh, what came up. A lot of times in capital murders, the reason why the district attorney's office will choose to seek the death penalty is because when they investigate this person, there's a lot of other offenses that they've committed that makes them just a threat to society, a mm -hmm. continuing threat to society. That's the, what they have to determine. And so a lot of times people come out of the woodwork when you get arrested and say, you know, kind of like Crime Stoppers. Right. They did this, they did this, and when they investigate it, they don't charge them for all these other things. They just use that in the punishment phase. Because mm -hmm. in the punishment phase, after being convicted, all bets are off. Every, you can throw everything at the person at, but the kitchen sink and the kitchen sink. Mm -hmm. yes. So And you can throw it all in there. Speculation, whatever people want to come say about you. I mean, to prove these cases in, a, in, in the punishment phase, you still have to have the police officers, the coroner. I mean, it's like a, it's, it's the other part of the trial. Mm -hmm. uh, and you can still, as a defense lawyer, investigate and defend that person like it didn't happen. And the jury decides trying to answer the questions, are they a continuing threat to society? That's the, that's the question they're answering in punishment. Mm -hmm. If they don't believe it, they should say no, mm -hmm. which spares your life. You get the li life. But if they say yes, that's one of the, th the three questions they have to answer that will lead you to the death row. You don't actually get the death penalty. The jury answers three questions. Okay? Let me take a call. Caller, you're on. Uh, yeah. Yes, uh, I was calling. I was watching your show. Talk on the phone and uh, turn your volume down so we can uh, hear you. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I, you know, I'm a minister here in Houston, and uh, I work with homeless people. And uh, <clears throat> my thing is, I don't. I personally, Miss King, don't believe in the. Uh, the death penalty period, because you, you have a lot of people, and it's, I watch a lot of news, right, that have been exonerated, and later on, years and years after they have spent a lot of time, they get exonerated because of DNA evidence and so forth. But I was incarcerated about 12 years ago, and I had an eight, uh, eight-year sentence. And they sent me to a unit, and the first thing I saw when I went in there was this big sign that said death row. And I'm like, I only have eight years uh, for a crime that I uh, did commit. And I got eight years, and they sent me to this unit with death row on there. And when I went in for classification, the warden said, why did they send you here? I said, I have no idea. <laughs> and so they put me out on the trans, uh, what do you what he called a trustee camp, but that scared the daylights out of me. I bet you didn't go back, did you? Oh, no, I haven't been. I, <laughs> I did my time. I finished. I did all of it. I got a letter saying that I completed my sentence, and that's been about, uh, I've been out about 10 years, and I've been working with the homeless and moving. Well, I'd, I'd love to tell your story, so just uh, call me one day or email me so we can schedule you to be on the show. Well, yeah, certainly, but let me just say say this before I go, please. Um, a lot of women are fighting for equal rights, you know, and uh, there should be no disparity in terms of, uh, I don't know if you disagree or not, but there should be no disparity. I, like I said initially, I don't believe in the death penalty, 
but there should be no disparity. I mean, if a woman commits a crime, uh, uh, that's uh, uh, she should be, you know, uh, treated just like a male who commits a crime, you know. But although I don't believe in the death penalty, but you know, women are fighting and fighting and fighting for certain rights uh, to be equal. I was listening earlier about the uh, the uh, the fight that they're having now based on the equal pay for equal work, and I agree with that. Uh, but when it comes to certain things, uh, I don't think that they should be uh, treated any differently. And you don't think because women, we are your mothers and your girlfriends and your wives and your daughters, that we should get special privileges under the law, even if we're killers? Well, I think we should get, I think our women should have uh, certain privileges, certainly. And, uh, <laughs> I just I just want to break it down. I just want to make sure I'm clear. I agree with you. I don't I don't believe in the death penalty, but I do um, I do believe that if it's given, it should be given equally. So I, I agree with you. I'm just giving you a hard time. Well, certainly I understand. I saw a boy on that uh, last, but uh, yeah, thank you. Thanks. Okay, Let make sure to contact me because I I want to tell your story. Okay. Thank you. All right. Um, so anyway, this is a very emotional case. Um, let's, uh, we just have a few minutes left. Let's talk a little bit about violence, period. I mean, we live in a very, very violent society, and there seems to be a strong correlation between drugs and violence, on the one hand. Mm -hmm. Then on the other hand, there's just kids that, you know, gang members that just like to kill each other. You know, he crossed the line, or he's on this street and shouldn't be on that street. There is still nonsensical violence because I, you know, I deal with that. Uh, that doesn't always seem to be drug related. It can be kind of territorial. I think drugs are always playing, but mm -hmm. even in people's sober minds, they still believe that somebody deserved killing. Um, what do we do as a society about all the violence? What do you think, Charlie? What What do we do? What happened but, to old-fashioned fist fight? Well, well, old-fashioned old fist fight is out the way. That's gone. I mean, I asked a young man the other day, he said, oh, that's over, man. Yeah, that's over. There's no more of that. I mean, uh, basically, he, they, they talk about trying to deal with violence as a whole, but violence, it get that way and it continue on because most people doesn't just go away. I mean, everybody's saying they had a space. And when you cross in space, I mean, you get to that point. But for those that doesn't go that far, it doesn't necessarily happen. I mean, you can kind of go the opposite way. I mean, but it's there, and since it's there, you're going to have to deal with it. So basically, if you take the situation about the uh, shooting at the school, I mean, when it's all said and done, uh, the guy had a permit for the gun. I mean, at least this is what was told. Are you talking about the Lone Star situation? Right. Uh, let's ask, let me talk about this, though. Let's talk about just something as basic because we don't have much time i don't want to have to tell the background to that lone star case i thought that, although i think that's a good topic to discuss uh and i'm going to try to get the lawyer on for the young man who got his case dismissed so we can talk about it in more depth but what about just a, a drug case like this case you go and kill your neighbor that is thinking you is opening a door for you to give you some sugar because you asked for some sugar like in the mccarthy case that's cold no, that's cold that's, that's wrong cold. I'm I mean not saying that, the punishment. I'm not talking about the punishment, but just the the, 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 cold, the coldness of that action. Don't yeah. get, isn't that cold? I mean, it don't get no colder than that. It doesn't I mean, get no colder than I mean, that. You unless next, you're killing your children. And, and then a at the fact member. that the person is a, a elderly person. Seventy-one years old, supposed to be retired, uh, enjoying retirement. It don't get no colder than that. Well, I could say this: when an individual is on drugs, their actions is not their own. But you get a, it? Yeah. yeah it's it's a mind-altering situation going on, so they're really not themselves. Let's take this last call. Um, caller, you're on. Turn your, turn your volume down and talk into your receiver. Thank you. I apologize. I just want to make a couple of comments. Number one, uh, Ms. Vivian King, everybody knows, hands down, that you're going to fight to the end for your clients, and you keep doing that, and you keep fighting a good fight, okay? Sometimes people just won't understand, and, and more importantly, that the, you need to know is that you can't understand some people. Mm -hmm. They are what they are. They do what they do. But you fight for them regardless because you believe in your heart in 
and doing your part. And what happens, happens from there. And at the end of the day, uh, you're on that side of the bar because you make better decisions, and you can't make anyone make better decisions. You can only help them and guide them. It's up to them at that point. And some some point, uh, you know, you can rest assured you've done your best. The second point I want to make or a statement I want to make is that uh, as far as that, uh, the case with uh, uh, McCarthy up in Dallas, uh, there are a lot of issues. And one of the things that I hear a lot of people say is that, um, you know, oh, my gosh, that, you know, they're appealing again. They're appealing again. And what's the point of this? It just keeps going on and on. Listen, uh, we're talking about killing someone, whether it's justified or not, whether it's the state doing it or someone else. When, you, when the state of Texas executes a death row inmate, it is murder. It is killing someone else and taking a human life. What is the rush? If there is any possible area that needs to be litigated, what is the rush? And my position is take all the time you need, okay? Take all the time you need. And I think in this case there were a lot of issues uh, beyond what you've already spoken about. Mm -hmm. uh, personally, I have my own opinion about the death penalty. But you know what? My opinion about the death penalty in no way reflects my opinion about the crimes that put people on death row. Mm -hmm. Those are two separate opinions, two separate feelings, and two separate discussions. And a lot of times uh, people want to paint it black and white and say, well, if you're against the death penalty, then you somehow you're, you're condoning the behavior that mm -hmm. got people to death row. And that is absolutely a false premise. And it's got no room in the discussion of whether or not the death penalty should exist in the United States of America going forward. And those are my comments about that. Keep up the good fight. Thanks for everybody for being there. And I enjoy watching your show. Thanks for what you do. God bless you all. God bless, God bless you, you too. Hang up. Thank you, sweetheart. Thanks. Thank you for your comments. Um, and thank you. I needed that word of encouragement because I, I got someone, a case dismissed in federal court today, but then there's that lady that's still thinking it's my fault. So thank you. I'll be fighting a good fight. Um, yeah, the, 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 and I think the thing in society, and, and, and like the caller said, we do, we, what's the rush? Now we have life without parole. So even mm -hmm. if her sentence was commuted, it would be life without parole. Although it might be what the law was back then, which was, uh, life was not life without parole. So I'm not sure. I really, I'm really not sure about that because back in 98, it was not life without parole. We didn't have that. Um, so what is the rush? But she'll be there um, until she dies one way or another. And as the caller said, when the state kills you, it's, it's, it's a homicide. Yeah. Yeah. It's, a, it's murder either it's way. It's like uh, murder for murder. It's murder for murder. So it's like, are we going to just stop paying for it? I mean, we're going to pay for somebody on death row either way, so mm -hmm. she might as well stay out of society. And apparently she hadn't killed anybody in, in prison. And a lot of people have revelations, like you said, like Carla Faye, they find God. So uh, maybe we shouldn't rush to judgment. But the prosecutors in Dallas County have a different way of thinking. Um, the prosecutor there has, he asked the judge, the new prosecutor there that has only been there since 06, uh, Mr. Watkins, asked the judge of the court, which is not going to be the same judge that was there, to let's stay the execution, change the date. Her new uh, execution date is April 3rd. And let's review it one more time with fresh eyes, new prosecutors, mm -hmm. you know, some more defense lawyers. Let's look at it one more time to see if any mistakes were made or if there's a way that we can. I think they're trying to commute it to a life sentence. That's what, that would be the most humane thing to do. Because the thing that society is always worried about is even though drugs are mood altering, a lot of us like to drink, party, do mood altering drugs, but it doesn't make us violent. Right. And some people have more courage to do violence when they're on mood-altering drugs. And they've chosen to ingest the drug. Mm -hmm. And we all have free will. And no one can control another person's free will. So that becomes a dilemma for society. I want you to be able to walk in society without knowing that this person can kill you. Right. And I want you to be able to walk. I want you to be able to walk. Renita, it looks like you have a thought. Yeah, but every, everyone has a choice. Right. And although, and I do, you know, people are provoked to do certain violent acts. Um, I don't know. I just, you know, with with certain with certain, the way she, you know, this she killed three elderly women. 
That's what the that's what the punishment phase says. It gets worse. It got worse when but she got the new trial. But like but like Miss Alicia says, you know, uh, when you're under any type of influence, you're not yourself. I would think every murder was under influence since she was a crackhead. So mm -hmm. she went immediately in her neighbor's Mercedes to a crack house. Right. You're not thinking about the consequences. This is not a premeditated crime. Mm -hmm. What I find a lot when you talk to violent people is the crime is not premeditated. That's the thing that's scary in society. Obviously, if you're going to think about killing your neighbor, you're not going to think about driving in her car when you just bludgeoned her to death and you just cut her finger off for her ring. And you just, you know that the police are going to be there, Johnny, on the spot. You know that her car, they're going to look to see if her car is there. So obviously, this is uh, something that just happened spur of the moment, chasing that crack, chasing, chasing drugs. So, you know, that's another thing that's scary is these crimes. When I talk to people who've committed heinous crimes, it's rare. I've never, I don't think I've ever talked to anybody who was premeditated. It's usually, I got a gun, it's spontaneous, it's a reaction to something. Every now and then it's planned like an hour ahead of time. Like, if you don't bring me my money, I'm going to kill him. You know, mm -hmm. it's, it's that kind of plan, but it's not anything planned out. It, we're getting close to the end. It looks like we have another call. Turn your volume down and talk on the receiver. Thank you. Oh, yes, ma'am. Um, I was calling to kind of like comment about, uh, on the topic. Um, you have to turn that volume down, sweetheart. We can't, we can't hear you. Talk, talk to me on the phone. Yes, ma'am. Okay, can you hear me now? Yeah, but we have about two minutes, so please hurry. Okay. Listen, I was, uh, you know, my thing is that I feel like if someone, you know, uh, unjustly or just uh, uh, kills someone for no reason, you know, senseless, I, you know, to me, you know, I just, I just get 30 years in prison. I've been on five. Uh, but I just don't feel like, you know, you take someone's life like that, that, you know, uh, I, I, I think, I think that, 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 that you should give a life. You know what I'm saying? Because there's nothing to bring back the life that you took. And, you know, and I heard you say something about being humane. But what, what was so humane about this lady taking those three people's lives like that? It's awful. I agree with you. It's awful. It's awful. In our society, the way it was founded and what we learned is that we should be more humane. I mean, that's the way it was originally written. The Supreme Court cases said that. I mean humane in that she's in prison and can't hurt anybody. There's nothing humane about prison, as far as I see. Mm -hmm. and, and even death row. I mean, you know. Alicia's been to prison. There's nothing humane about You've been to prison. There's nothing humane about prison, especially death row. The death row, they're treated differently. So I'm not saying anything other than I think that she should be out of society. I do not condone violence at all. Um, if I would have become a judge, that would have been my pet peeve would have been violence. I, I do not, I mean, violence, I, would, I, I don't stand for violence. I, I don't like violence. I was raised around violence. I, I hate violence. I abhor <coughs> violence. So I think people should have a right to be able to live their lives without someone else killing them or beating them up or shooting them or stabbing them. That's a no-no. We've got to live in this big world together and we cannot be violent on another person. So I do understand your position on uh, thinking it should be a life for life. I do understand <coughs> your position and I can participate in the death penalty. I just, I would, if I was king of this world, I wouldn't have death penalty. I would have life without parole. But I respect our judicial system and I, I definitely work within the, I mean, I represent people on death row. Uh, I, I do understand it. Yes, and I do, I've talked to many victims, so I do understand how devastated people are when people, uh, when they've had a loved one that's been murdered senselessly. Like you said, for no reason at all, without there being an ongoing beef, just, mm -hmm. you know, just going next door to take an old lady's life, uh, that's just yeah, senseless. Man, it's not right, you know. It's wrong. It's even, not, you know, even people that, you know, that ran to the movie theater and things like that, you know, that's senseless, you know? Crazy. So I don't think that we should waste our time and money, you know, talking about uh, the, um, the law with these people, you know what I mean? That's right. it. You know, you, you know what I mean? Come on, you know? I understand your position. I just kind of wanted to talk about, since it's a current event and my guest didn't show up, why uh, we should talk about if women should be treated the same on death row. Thank you for watching. Yeah. Keep watching, and you're welcome to call me later or email me and be on the show and tell your story. All right, thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. All right, let's wrap it up. I'm uh, My director's saying we have four minutes, so let's kind of close out. Charlie, I'm going to start with you. Do you have any closing comments? You can look at me or you can look at the camera and just... Tell me what you think about our discussion tonight. Uh, our discussion is great tonight. And basically, uh, the DA, 
took charge in this case that we're talking about. And from from that point, he said, hey, let's review it again. So, I mean, what's the, what's the rush? I agree. Renita, what, what comments do you have to make about uh, McCarthy getting a stay of execution? Her new date is April 3rd. The DA looking at it again and or uh, the treatment, the disparity, if there is one between men and women. I think the underlying, um, I guess, gratitude goes to the justice system. The fact that um, the judge, as well as the DA, decided to give someone another chance, in your case with the lady that you're working with now, and as well as the lady on death row. Um, so the fact, you know, that they are, you know, looking at it and giving, you know, really trying to make sure that this is a solid decision that they're about to make. Um, and, you know, because they have someone's life in their hand. Um, and as far as women on the on death row, like the caller stated, I don't, you know, we fought so long to be equal <laughs> to men. So, you know, if, you know, if you want to act as the baddest, then you play with the baddest and you, you go down the, like the baddest. Right, you go down with, you go down with the baddest. So I, I don't think that there should be a division between a man or a woman. If you committed the crime, then you must pay the time. All right, we're going to close out with you, Alicia. Uh, my opinion is, uh, like the caller stated, you know, I have two different emotions as far as the um, the death penalty is concerned and as far as the crime, the violence, you know. I hate violence myself, you know. I didn't grow up around it, but I put myself in the streets with it, and I hate it. Um, you know, those crimes she committed, <coughs> you know, uh, we don't know what state of mind she was in, you know. Uh, but on two aspects, I see that two different situations here that we've discussed. Ms. King, uh, these two ladies are being given a chance. One, your client. You know, I'm going to state this. Uh, back in the days, there was no talking to the judge nor the prosecutor. You know, uh, that's I was blown when you said, you know, that the lady was able to uh, discuss her theft situation with the prosecutor. Yeah, I and wanted her, you gonna cry to me? Debate to her so we can all have this out together. But I think it's a beautiful thing that the prosecutor wouldn't talk to her. They don't have to do that. And that's right, that's what I'm saying. Back in the days, that. you didn't have any of that. Mm -hmm. You was gonna deal with your lawyer, This, that's it, and that's all. And uh, I just wanna push and you that I, And I talked to the judge in the back, and the judge said, Miss King, you want me to talk to her for you? I'll tell her, I'll give her one more chance for me to look at whether she could get probation. Okay. So that's a lot of pressure. And then my girl, I got a case dismissed, and I'm gonna put her on the bus to Nevada. So I mm. feel good about that. Well, I just want to push you up, you know, on that because uh, that's a plus. Mm -hmm. Because uh, you know we could all be stereotypical in life, in the old way. Uh, Court-appointed lawyers, we've always stated they're not for you. But from your point of view. I say you for the people. That's right. Yeah. And my little girl That's in the bottom, I'm about, to go, I'm about to go buy some clothes. Go do your thing. And I'm going to get her. She wears size 8. I wear 7 and a half. I'm going to see if she can squeeze in some of my big 7 and a half. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm going I'm to I'm I'm send her home looking cute. Cool. Okay. All right. All right. Thank you for watching Truth and Justice with Vivian King. Hopefully you'll tune in next week uh, where we talk about some current e events, to current affairs. Someone will tell their crime story, and if not, we'll just talk about current events again. Hopefully we can talk about the Lone Star uh, shooting and the young man that was falsely accused, and he was released. That's the topic that I want to discuss next week. So thank you for calling. Make sure to look at the credits at the end. If you have a story you want to tell, call me, email me. I want to tell your story. Thank you. Thank you for tuning in again. Tonight we have something really good, a hot topic of news this week. He's been charged with crime. This is a show where I try to educate.